Alrighty. Let's see where we pick up page number in your books there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Page number 41 in your books. Been going through a course here, an unshakable faith and apologetics course. Uh, just covering several topics we have looked at. Oh man, we've looked at several things so far. Anybody, anything, anybody have anything that has uh, stood out to them or, um, you know, that you've learned maybe that you didn't know or uh, answered a question that you had before? Any, anybody have anything? I know that's a broad question. We've looked at the Bible's nature, um, the Bible's proof. Yeah, that, that was very interesting. The Dead Sea Scrolls, right. Yes, that was good. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. It's just It just amazes me. It amazes me how, uh, again, you have the Isaiah Scroll uh, amongst, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls there, but the Isaiah Scroll just matching perfectly, uh, all but perfectly with the copy that is, you know, a thousand years, written a thousand years later, you know, it's just... It's just proof that God has preserved his words. And the modern critic likes to say that we have God's word in the, you know, multiplicity of translations. And uh, anyway, it's a deep topic we don't want to get into right now. But <clears throat> anybody have anything else? Nothing. Well, I'm glad Mrs. Powers learned something. <laughs> No, there's a lot there. There's a lot there, I know. So, uh, again, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. We started last week looking at the Bible's difficulties. The Bible's difficulties. By the way, I've got a confession to make. This isn't the Catholic Church, but I'll confess before everybody. I'm bitter. I'm bitter at my pastor and Colby. <laughs> Yesterday we're, we're going out fishing, and <clears throat> I had suggested that because there's a sandy beach, I said, man, you could almost just you know bring the boat right into shore and just let it rest on the sand, you know? So the first time we did that, a couple of us got out and we pulled the boat until it hit sand and then somebody would hop out of the boat so it lifted a little bit. Then we pulled it in a little further and Pastor was like the last one out of the boat. We got him, you know, just a few feet from shore. So he just had to get his feet wet. Well, then uh, I didn't go the next day, but the following day they had done the same thing. They pulled the boat in there and they we go to get, go fishing and right on shore, Pastor hops in the boat so he doesn't get his feet wet. Colby hops in the boat so he doesn't get his feet wet. And then Titus and I have to push him out, like, in the sand. And I threw my back out. And I've been walking around like, oh, I'm hurting, I'm hurting. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I tweaked my lower back. It's like, oh, so I'm out there fishing yesterday. I'm hurting. I'm bitter at my pastor. I'm bitter at my pastor. Well, no, he did try to help. He was trying to push out with the, with the, uh, the paddle there, but... No, it's funny. Anyway, it has nothing to do with our lesson. I just thought I'd make the confession so that, you know, it's out there. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. Second <clears throat> uh, Peter 3.15. <clears throat> An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Okay, so he said that Peter states here that the Bible contains things that are hard to be understood. And specifically he mentions the Apostle Paul's writings, but we understand that 
there are things throughout the scriptures that are difficult to understand. Now, we mentioned last week what that word rest means. Do you know, do you remember what that word rest means? What's that? Twist, yeah, it's along those lines. Um, more specifically, <clears throat> right, okay, so the word rest, I, I always, when I would read it, I always thought, well, you know, they wrestle with them, you know, they struggle with them, they can't understand them, but really it means to pervert or uh, literally to torture, <clears throat> excuse me, torture on the rack, and, and the rack was uh, a torture device that would stretch, stretch people, they'd tie them, and they'd, I mean, they'd pull them and they literally pull things out of joint. So the idea here is that they they stretch the scriptures to mean things that they do not mean. They take things out of context. And you'll see this all over the place today where people will, critics will point to the Bible and say, well, the Bible says this, you know, God is a, you know, he's a, oh man, I can't even remember all the terms they call him, you know, uh, you know, misogynistic and, you know, he's uh you know, he, he was for child sacrifice, you know, because Christ died on the cross, therefore he must promote child sacrifice. And, I mean, it's, it's like they just take things and twist them. And, and you know, God commanded, he, he was, a, you know, he's a bigot and a racist because he commanded these Old Testament um, nations to be wiped out. And they just, they don't, they do, well, first of all, so many of them don't read the Bible. They don't want to know about the Bible. They don't want to learn the Bible. They have no interest. All they do is sit back and criticize. But there are those that will point to these difficulties in Scripture and just, just pull them out of context. And so they do so, according to Peter, to their own destruction. To their own destruction. Okay? And we said, it's... It, it this type of thing should not come as a surprise to us because all through the Bible, all through the Old, or, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, excuse me, the writers told us this would happen. The writers told us that there were those who would pervert the scriptures. There are false teachers. And we looked at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 last week. And I'd like to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians Chapter 4, and we, I did not pray before we began here, so let's pray. Lord, we do ask for your wisdom as we look at the Bible today. Help us to be wise in an evil day, and please help us in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Okay, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. All right, so there are those who are desirous to deceive. It shouldn't come as a surprise. We looked last week in, in Corinthians and we said Satan has, I mean, according to these verses, Satan has ministers that he uses to promote uh, doubt, to push questioning God's word. And boy, do they sound good. And we said, you know, the author there says, well, that shouldn't surprise us because Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He looks really good, right? Satan is not the, uh, you know, the prototypical you know, a little red man with a, you know, a pointy tail and horns on his head. That is not Satan. Satan is uh, probably the most beautiful creation that God ever made. I mean, he's the most beautiful angel. I mean, just, and he is attractive. And so his ministers are deceptive. They are very um, convincing, very subtle, very seductive in their teaching. And so the New Testament authors warn us, warn us about these people. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 17, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them 
which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay, Paul says, there are enemies of the cross of Christ. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, verse 8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. It is amazing, amazing, as you read through these verses, how applicable and pertinent they are to today. And, of course, again, that shouldn't shock us. It's God's eternal word, right? But, man, the false teachers today are so deceptive. I gave the example of last week of this uh, uh, Mark Ward um, and it's it's like why do you feel the need? Why do those who claim that you know any Bible version is okay, you know, there are these, these so many of the modern English versions are alright, feel the need to convince those that stand firmly upon um, the received text from which the King James is translated, or, yeah, from which the King James is translated, um, why do they feel the need to convince them of, uh, to use another Bible version? If you're fine with us, you know, if, if these, if you're fine with all these, multi, you know, these several different Bible versions, why, why do you feel the need to attack and to pinpoint us who are settled on this I don't get it. Um, they kind of contradict themselves in that way. But to just understand they are very, very, um, very subtle. Very, let's sit down and talk about this. You know, what, what's your view? And, and, and what they do is they, they get you talking. They get you um, thinking that oh, it's okay. We're friends. We're buddies. We're, you know, we believe the same thing really. And then over time, as you listen, as you read, as you pay attention, it starts to slowly change your mind because of uh, a person's personality even. You know, they're, they're just a nice guy. And they, they really do love the Lord. They, they want to do what's right. And, I, and again, I'm not saying that for those people that choose a different Bible version that they're all, you know, just out and out blatant wicked sinners. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying they can't be saved. I'm not saying they can't serve the Lord. All right, but... Just understand that there are those, you know, not just on this issue, um, but there are those, I mean, unsaved and saved alike, false teachers today. Uh, separation, the separation issue is not important today. We're supposed to become like the world, according to uh, many in our Christian circles today. We've got to appeal to them. We've got to uh, have fun, you know, provide entertainment. You know, the old hymns are just boring. That doesn't bring in the crowd. So we got to have a rock concert on stage. Um, you know, I mean, on down the line, the false teaching is very, very prevalent. And so it's very important that we understand that God warns us about them. God warns about them. And they will take the Bible and, like we saw in Peter, they will twist it. They will... Pull it. They will stretch it to mean things that it does not mean. And so understand that some of these people do know enough about the Bible to be dangerous. Okay? And so when they point to the scriptures that we claim as authority for our lives, and they say, well, the Bible says this, we've got to have the understanding to say, yes, the Bible says that. But it doesn't mean what you're saying it means or that you think it means. Because if you take it in the context, this is what it means. So we've got to be very, very careful today. Uh, For example, a big one I've mentioned before, um, Catholics will point to the book of James and say, well, faith without works is dead. I I mean, you'll just see this. You'll hear people say it. You'll see it in writing. Faith without works is dead. They'll also point to uh, Jesus in John chapter 3 where he says he that is uh, born of the spirit and of, or of, of water and of the spirit and they'll say see baptism is required for salvation he that is born of water 
Look at the context. He's talking a physical birth and a spiritual birth. You must be born again. Well, if you were born again, you had to be born the first time, right? What are you surrounded with in the womb? Water, <laughs> right? It's a physical birth, a spiritual birth. But they will pull these out of context and use them to support their false teachings. And so we've got to be diff- we've got to be very careful. And they will point to difficult passages. It's, it's more what we're centering on here. They will point to difficult passages and say, well, we can't understand this. This, this doesn't make sense unless, you know, uh, we explain it away by saying, well, the P, the, this must be, since we can't understand this and this doesn't line up with, God, you know, it's proof that man has had his fingers in the Bible and it's really just, uh, it's got some corrupt portions and we get, we get to determine what's right and what's wrong, what we like, what we don't like, what God said, what he didn't say. All right, and that's where they go with this stuff. <clears throat> okay, uh, turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy Chapter 4, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. We're seeing it all around us. I'm not very old and I've seen uh, friends drifting off. Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Boy, so Satan has ministers? Satan has doctrines? We use these same terms, right? You know, a minister of the Word of God. That's a good thing. Well, we've got to be discerning because, you know, people aren't standing on stage saying, you know, with name tags saying Satan's minister or God's minister. We've got to look at what they're teaching, how they're living, compare it to Scripture, and determine what they really are. Okay? But Satan has doctrines, teachings, okay? Speaking lies and hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Again, what does the Catholic Church do with that? That verse. Just, I mean, maybe they've taken it out of their Bible. I don't know. Um, I didn't check, but here we have, um, you know, they just teach false teachings, extra biblical teaching. Okay, and there's several other verses here we won't we won't look at. Uh, just uh, we'll read down through the book a little bit here. Second Timothy two three and four says end time Christians will trade sound doctrine for fables, and will be led in this diabolical business by heaps of teachers who are willing to scratch people's ears with new things. Okay. Second Peter two, Peter warns that many will teach damnable heresies even attacking the person and character of Christ. And by their false teaching and sensual lifestyle, they will bring great reproach upon Christianity. You ever feel that way when you see a Christian? And, and I understand that none of us are perfect, okay? I'm, we all have our own problems. But you ever see um, a person, I think of, you know, what I would think a lot of us could relate to, or at least because they're prominent, uh, you know, you get these sports stars today that live just totally worldly. You know, they're skipping church on Sundays, go to sports games. I mean, they're, they're you know, swearing and they're, I mean, just, just, I mean, party life. Nothing or very little about them speaks of Christianity. And then they stand up and say, you know, well, well God, you know, I'll give, you know, they, they point to the sky, you know, and they, whatever, you know get a touchdown or whatever they do, you know. They point to the sky as they go around the bases, you know, after they hit a home run, you know, like they're giving glory to God. And it's like, just stop. Just stop. You're you're bringing reproach on the cause of Christ, right? There's nothing Christian about your life or very little that is apparent to the world. And just stop. You're harming the cause. Jesus said, he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Okay, there's no neutral position here. If you're not helping the cause of Christ and, and serving the Lord, you are causing division, you're causing problems. Okay, that's the two options here. So uh, Peter 
you know, these damnable heresies, and they just uh, it, it just brings reproach on the cause of Christ. There's no, it's no wonder today that people are so apprehensive about the Bible because there's so many religions, there's so many teachings, there's so many places and people who have burned uh, people who, who, who are trying to go to church or, or trying to do what's right, and they just get burned by these uh, false teachers. You know, I, I think of a lady we were talking to, I can't remember who I was with one time, but um, she was really upset. She went to the Pentecostal church, and she just wanted to be there. And I can't remember if it was her son who was like five at the time, supposedly started speaking in tongues or something like that. And then she, or, or no, maybe it was she did and her son wanted to and they told her her son couldn't yet. or son, I can't remember. She was offended. And now granted, you know, the whole speaking in tongues teaching today is totally unbiblical. But she was offended. She was she was bothered. She's like, why, why can't my son be involved in church here, right? So people get uh, just offended at, at a church that they associate to be to be uh, Christian or, or godly, and it brings reproach on the cause of Christ when it was false teaching from the very beginning, you know. But it just causes us problems who are trying to to teach you know, the Bible trying to, well, yeah, well, I went to this church that taught the Bible years ago and they did this. Well, they didn't teach the Bible. <laughs> they didn't live the Bible, okay? Again, it's satanic, truth with lies, truth with lies uh, from the very beginning. Okay, so um, he further warns in Second Peter that the end of the age there will be widespread unbelief toward the global flood and the second coming of Christ, scoffing, flagrant rejection of God's moral laws, Second Timothy teaches that this apostasy, which began in the days of the apostles, it's nothing new, will grow in intensity as the church age progresses. Okay. Number three there, the scoffing unbeliever is unreasonable in treating the Bible differently than other books. Okay. While he gives other books the benefit of the doubt and tries to find a solution to apparent problems, he treats the Bible with disdain and suspicion and often refuses to accept the most reasonable solution to a difficulty. George de Hoff rightly observes, even when there are several explanations for an alleged discrepancy, any of which could be the truth, skeptics claim to be unable to find any of them. Okay, and again, we kind of saw some of this where uh, um, back when we were looking at the nature of the Bible, and um, I can't remember the exact section, but basically where we looked at how nobody has a problem accepting the writings of Plato or Socrates, right? These ancient philosophers. Nobody has a problem with that. When the only written copies of their writings that we have are like hundreds, if not over a thousand years after they wrote, nobody says, well, I don't know about that. I think, I think probably somebody messed around with their writings. And then somehow... When it comes to the Bible, woof. I mean, the Bible was written like, you know, decades after Jesus walked on earth. And, and, you know, the manuscripts that we have, you know, I mean, they're just unreliable, even though they're, you know, like decades from the originals. Decades from the originals. And they're just very forgiving when it comes to secular writers. But somehow when it comes to the Bible, they're just overly critical. And, you know, you can't explain anything away, right? We have, again, thousands of copies of manuscripts, thousands of manuscripts, copied scriptures upon which our Bible is based, and somehow we're willing to accept just, you know, a few or a dozen of some secular writing. And, uh, but when it comes to the, to the Bible, they're just very unreasonable. They're not consistent, okay? There's a quote here from a book, The Grand Old Book, by A. McCaig. When we meet with seeming discrepancies in other writers, we try to find some way of explaining them without charging the author with inaccuracy, especially if he has shown himself generally trustworthy. With regard to many matters in ancient history which cannot be satisfactorily, satisfactorily explained, we suppose that if other facts were known to us, 
the difficulties would be cleared away. But unfortunately, it is the habit of many to treat the scriptures in exactly the reverse way. They magnify the difficulties. They ignore or reject all attempts at explanation. They jump at once to the conclusion that the writers are mistaken. Now, surely, this is most unscientific. If it is possible to find a way of explaining the difficulty, we are bound to do so. And if, after all, we are not sure that the difficulty is removed, we surely ought, in view of the general trustworthiness of the Bible historians, to believe that if we knew other facts which are now hidden from us, all would be clear. Okay? So again, just pointing out the hypocrisy in the Bible critic who will accept secular writings or other religious writings even um, and reject the validity of the Bible. Okay? <clears throat> but again, the reason, one of the reasons they claim one of the reasons they reject the Bible is because of some of the difficulties that we can't understand, that we can't wrap our minds around. And part of that is, as we're going to see, the fact they're just not saved. Um, the other part is uh, we can't understand every little detail. Okay, And sometimes they don't want to see it. They don't want to, to invest in figuring it out. They just look at it, take it at face value, and say, oh, that must be wrong. Okay, well, did you try comparing Scripture with Scripture? Did you look at the context of the book? Who was it written to? Why was it written? When was it written? Okay, there are, there's more to it than uh, to just take a verse and say, well, that must mean this, right? Typically, number four there, the scoffing unbeliever has not made the necessary effort to understand the Bible properly. We don't expect to be able to pick up a training manual for an F-16 fighter jet and understand it without the proper education. The scoffing unbelievers pretend that without any serious training and without proper experience in handling the Bible, they are capable not only of understanding it, but also of infallibly finding its imperfections. Okay. So, the author says, well, there's some requirements, requirements for understanding the Bible. We cannot approach the Bible like any other book. Because it's not any other book. And this, again, the world doesn't understand this. Those that approach the Bible from an unsaved perspective will find problems with it. They're just going to. <clears throat> okay. Here he says, To understand a book of mathematics requires the development of a mathematical mindset. And to understand the Bible requires the development of a spiritual mindset. The Bible tells us exactly how this is done. Okay, picture, picture a first grader or even a kindergartner picking up a calculus book. Okay, What's it? it's, it's going to make zero sense to them. Why? Because they haven't learned that three times three is nine. They haven't developed a mindset surrounding the topic. They haven't, they haven't uh, grown to understand the basics even. They haven't been introduced to the, um, to the fundamentals. And similarly, people that just pick up the Bible dive right into the complex aspects of the Bible and then say, well, that doesn't make sense. Therefore, it must not be true. No, <laughs> you didn't go about it in the right way. All right? You did not go about it in the right way. Let's start off with salvation first. Okay, Understand you're a sinner on your way to hell. You need the Holy Spirit to discern the Bible. You don't get the Holy Spirit unless you've received Christ as your Savior. Okay, So understand this as you deal with people, as you deal with critics. Be discerning because there are those that claim to be followers of God and still will find problems with the Bible. That ought to be a big red flag. A big red flag. We ought not be willing to accept somebody's, uh, readily accept the fact that they're saved if they are, you know, pointing out, well, the, this isn't true in God's Word, and that's not true in God's Word. You know, this is just, I mean, you'll see this. People say, well, there's portions of the Bible that are historically accurate, but, I mean, the flood, that's just blown way out of proportion, you know, and... Uh, that's exaggerated, obviously, for you know the agenda they were trying to push. Okay, if you have someone that starts to talk like that, you ought to seriously question 
their salvation because the Holy Spirit guides into all truth, and thy word is truth, right? And so, but, but just understand that, uh, anyway, I'm getting off topic here. Okay, but, but the, you know, going back to the grade schooler here, or the, the young person picking up a calculator, they, they don't understand. It's, it's foreign to them. Can the first grader justifiably say, well, that's, that's wrong. The calculus book, that's wrong. That's, that's not correct. No. It's just difficult. You can't understand it because you've not worked your way up to that level, right? And again, I'm not saying that there's you know levels in Christianity, but the Bible is a deep, deep book. And some things can be very easily understood. Praise the Lord, salvation is one of them. But there are difficulties in the Bible that's like, wow, you really got to study this. You've really got to dig in. And uh, if you've not worked your way into it, you know, somebody's not going to hop into the Bible and explain, you know, Daniel's prophecies, right? They're not going to just jump right in and have this great grasp of the book of Revelation, okay? <laughs> you start them off in, you know, Romans or John or, you know, even Genesis. Um, just, just something a little more understandable, Okay? First, to understand the Bible, the new birth is required. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel... Sorry, did I say where I was? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, and I'm in 2nd. Second. Second Corinthians. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, here we go, verse 12. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, that is, the unsaved man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Again, your little kid with a calculus book, okay? I mean, I mean, just to make it applicable here, and we know it might not be the greatest uh, picture, illustration, you know, but, but the young person, the inexperienced, right, receives not the thing of calculus, it's foolishness unto them. Why? Because they're mathematically discerned and they've not learned the very basics. They like like you're not there yet. Okay? And so it's foolish for an unsaved person to look at the difficulties of the Bible and say, "Well, that, that must not be true. There, there's error there. We got problems." Because they've never even gotten saved. Again, I'm not trying to belittle the work of the Holy Spirit comparing, you know, to a math teacher or anything like that. But just, just understand that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God, you're not going to get the difficulties of the Bible. You're not going to understand them. Even those that are saved, Peter says, there are some difficult things. Okay? We're just humans. But God faithfully as we strive to dig into the Bible, we'll teach and teach and open our eyes. Those that are unregenerate, unsaved, cannot interpret the Bible correctly. They will find conflicts and problems because they do not have the indwelling Holy Spirit and therefore do not have a spiritual mind. Before I can understand the Bible properly, I must humble myself before God as a needy sinner and receive Jesus Christ as my only Savior and Lord. This is how one is born again, and at that time, spiritual life is imparted. The darkened mind is enlightened, and the individual is sealed with the Holy Spirit, who becomes his spiritual teacher. There's a quote here from the pulpit commentary. It says, The deepest biblical scholar, if he fails to find Christ, knows less of the real meaning of the gospel than the humblest Christian who is living in the faith of the Son of God. And again, we, 
we've seen this play out. I gave it several times now the example of Bart Ehrman, just, just Bible scholar, went to college for it, grew up in the church, right? And can't explain why they're suffering on earth. Well, I just couldn't wrap my mind around how they're suffering. If God is love, how they're suffering. Three-letter word there, pal. Sin. <laughs> He's not saved. He's not saved. He's a brain, a Bible scholar, but he's not saved. And when it came to the difficult things of Scripture, if you want to call that a difficulty, he had a problem with it. Okay, He couldn't get past it. And so he, you know, quote, leaves the faith, really, that he never had. But just understand that just because they're a Bible scholar doesn't mean that they're right on the Bible. Okay, They might be really smart, but if they don't have the Holy Spirit guiding them, they will be off on things. Secondly, and lastly, here real quick, uh, faith is required. Right? Hebrews 11. I'll know this verse. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, faith is required to understand these things in the scriptures. Okay, Can I understand how God made the global flood? No. It seems astronomical to me as well. Like, you just can't fathom it. Can we understand how God raised people from the dead? No. That's the difficulty, right? It's like, that's, that's humanly impossible, or it just doesn't make sense, right? How does walk, marching around the walls of a giant city seven times for seven days, you know, one time each, and then the seventh day, you know, march around seven times and blow your trumpets? Yeah, that makes sense. It's a great battle tactic, right? Happens all the time across the world. <laughs> no, it doesn't make sense. But faith is a requirement for understanding the Bible. And when you understand the God of the Bible, it really opens up your mind to say, wow, okay, that's the explanation. God. God is the explanation for some of the, dif for, well, the difficulties in Scripture. All right? Even if I don't understand them, if you understand that God is bigger than your understanding, and you accept that fact, it makes sense. Okay? So, uh, a new birth is required, faith is required, and we'll keep going on this next week. Requirements for understanding the Bible. And let's pray.